I'd like to welcome everyone to this uh, first in our pair of Kapiyanagi Prize uh, presentations for uh, this year. The Kapiyanagi Prize in Computer Science is a uh, cooperation between Carnegie Mellon University and the Tokyo University of Technology, named in honor of Mr. Ko Kapiyanagi, who's uh, provided the funding that makes this uh, award possible. And so, uh, together, we annually pick a, a pair of uh, prominent researchers, won what we call the Emerging Leadership Prize, for somebody uh, more in their formative stages, let's say, and won the Leadership Award, which we'll present next month to Barbara Wiskoff. Um, and so I encourage you to come back there. You might be interested, uh, Tokachi Nagi is a uh, Japanese entrepreneur who started a, a collection of uh, trade schools in Japan starting in 1947 uh, to train people how to uh, do the assembly of electronics components. And so a lot of what he did was help make Japan be able to uh, become the sort of post-war electronics that they became. Uh, in 1988, he founded Tokyo University of Technology, which uh, sort of raised up the level of, of the endeavor, and it currently has campuses both in the outskirts of Tokyo, the sort of western end, and right in the center of Tokyo, with about 6,000 students total. Uh, so this uh, award then, the selection process involves a collection of faculty at, at CMU and uh, another group at Tokyo University of Technology, and we also solicit uh, ideas and opinions from other people uh, around and come up with two award winners each year. And uh, this year we're very pleased to be able to make the award to Scott Clymer of Stanford. And I'm going to have Justine Cassell, head of the uh, Human Computer Interaction Institute, give the introduction to Scott. And then we will make the presentation and then we will give his lecture. So we're very, very happy to have Scott Clemmer here with us today. He did his undergraduate degree in art and semiotics at Brown, no surprise, where else can you do an undergraduate degree in art and semiotics, and computer science. Uh, already as an undergraduate, he was doing internships at interdisciplinary research think tanks, such as Interval and Noah, the CG Research Lab. He went to graduate school at Berkeley, where he worked with James Landai. And that, in fact, makes him Brad Meyer's grand student, <laughs> uh, a point about which Brad and all of us are very proud. So one of the things that's particular about Scott's research and that makes him a leader in this field is that he's interested not just in the product of computing and the product of human-computer interaction, but in its process. That is not whether something is a good interface, but in how we get to good interfaces. Not just how to design or how to teach design, but what, what the best way is to do design. And from early in his career, he's been looking at how we prototype, what we prototype as lay users of computers and as expert programmers, what the physical and social conditions are that affect interaction around prototyping, around prototyping and around design, and what leads to the best amount, the sweet spot that allows creativity in the design of interfaces and the programs themselves. Increasingly over the last couple of years, he's become interested in one part of that, which is the effect that access to examples has for lay programmers and for experts, for lay users and for experts. And that's what he's going to be talking to us about today. After we hand on the check and <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm pleased to present you the, the uh, Kathy Nagy Emerging Leadership Prize in Computer Science. Thank you very much. Yeah.
It's a really great honor to be here today. CMU has been a place that has led and nurtured and created so many of the fundamental advances in human-computer interaction. Um, and uh, the impact has been really multi-generational, as Justine pointed out. And in particular, it's great to be here with so many former mentors and friends and, and other people that I've worked with over the years. I wanted to start out with, uh, with a question, which is uh, raise your hand if you've made a web page. All right, good audience, great. And raise your hand if when you were learning HTML, you looked at the source and examples of other pages as part of that. And all the hands go up again. And I think that uh, for its ability to scaffold learning, view source is a real pinnacle of user interface design and has enabled a lot of the explosion that we've seen on the web today. And you're not alone. Here's my friend Jimmy. This is a page he made in graduate school. And uh, Brad's student, uh, James Landay, thought that was a pretty keen page. So <laughs> he borrowed that, changing relevant elements like uh, colors, what the layout was to fit what he needed. And uh, someone you may all know, Bonnie John, uh, also liked this page and asked Jimmy whether she could borrow it, changing again some of the layout, flipping the header. And uh, designers know this. So designers use examples regularly. This has long been a staple of art and design education. And I think the reason for that is that examples provide context. They provide implementation, how you do something. And they provide composition, showing how multiple chunks relate together to compose a whole. And so what I'd like to talk about today are four research themes on how we can create and compare alternatives on how we can use tools to help people work with examples and adapt them to new situations. And then the last thing I'll talk today is teaching with examples. And uh, in, the, in this talk today, I'll draw from examples in uh, visual design and interaction design from the fine arts, from programming, from physical products, because the point that I'd like to make is, is much broader than any one domain of, of design. And to start out with, uh, I, I like this quote from Ansel Adams where he says, there's no rules of composition in photography. There are only good photographs. And this is interesting because Ansel Adams wrote a book on the rules of composition in photography. In fact, he wrote not just one book. He wrote the canonical trilogy on the rules of composition and printmaking and other techniques in photography. And so either this guy is completely crazy uh, or I think he's trying to make a subtler point, which is that there are plenty of rules of composition and printmaking and other te techniques in photography. But that in any given instant, what actually matters is, is whether that thing coheres and that thing works. And that's the, the ultimate crucible of success. And I'd like to get uh, out of the way a few worries that you might have about using examples in design. And one of them is that if we start out with examples, that it'll really constrain our thinking. And this is a worry that, uh, that Stephen Smith at Texas A&M had. And uh, he had people create and draw aliens. And he would either give them examples of aliens that all had four legs, a head, and a tail, or, uh, or not. And what he found was that, yes, if you give people examples of aliens that have four legs, a head, and a tail, that's, they're going to be more likely to create future things that have four legs, a head, and a tail. And so we may worry. You may say, you know, oh, no. You know, is nothing new ever going to be created again? This is really bad. Well, there's a clever twist on this study that Marsh did a few years later. Same prime, four legs, head, and a tail. And the tweak on this is going to be, uh, instead of counting whether you borrow the four legs, the head, and the tail, we're going to count how many radically novel ideas you come up with in your aliens. And what he found is that the number, the amount of stuff that you come up with that's really novel is exactly the same no matter what you get the examples. And so what this suggests is that examples help us out when we might otherwise be stuck or not have a good idea. Uh, but it's not going to prevent us from transcending beyond what, what uh, we might have otherwise. And so that's kind of good news. And uh, I, I love this quote from Jonathan Lethem where he writes that apprentices graze in the field of culture. And my experience, uh, Justine mentioned I, I was originally trained in, in art semiotics as a graphic designer. And uh, art school is, in essence, uh, to give a computer science explanation to it, four years of programming by demonstration. You walk into school on day one, the lights go down, uh, painting comes on the screen, somebody explains, here's a painting, 
uh, here's what's good, here's what's bad. Here's another painting, here's what's good, here's what's bad. You, you know, lights go up, now you make a painting. Next week you come in, the lights go down, four years. And it's, it's tremendously powerful. <laughs> So another worry that you might have is, is this just for small innovations? And uh, I think a really forceful advocate for the opinion that examples, or rather that uh, design by examples is only valuable for small things is uh, Edgar Dijkstra. And, and he writes that, uh, you know, by means of metaphors and analogies, we try to link the new to the old, the novel to the familiar. And under sufficiently slow and gradual change, this is great. However, in the case of a sharp continuity, this breaks down. Our past experience is no longer relevant. Our analogies become too shallow, and the metaphors become more misleading than illuminating. This is the situation of radical novelty. And the best way I, I, I know how to, uh, to counter this point is, uh, here's a painting by Picasso, Les Demoiselles de Avignon. And a lot of art historians uh, claim that this is the most written about painting of the 20th century. I'm sure there are others that, that could have this claim, but this is a big deal. It's one of the founding paintings of cubism and of, uh, and of modern art in a lot of ways. And in preparation for this painting in 1907, Picasso made hundreds of sketches. And uh, at, in 1907, in the spring, his friends bring him to the Ethnographic Museum of Paris at the time, the Trocadero. And there in the Ethnographic Museum, uh, he sees these Fang sculptures, which had just arrived. And these Fang sculptures had an insight about how to represent the face that at the time was unknown in Europe. And it had a new, a new means of expression. And so Picasso sees this, and he realizes that he can use that. And he adapted that for the two right-hand faces in this painting here. And his inspirations for this painting were not just that, that Fang sculpture. The square proportions of the painting came from an El Greco painting. I mean, a square is something that we're all familiar with. But the insight of when and how to use a square, seeing this El Greco painting helped Picasso. And overall, the crude brushstrokes in this painting uh, came from his friendship and rivalry with Matisse. They traded paintings while Picasso was working on this. And so this is why Picasso says, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal. And what this shows us is that examples are not just training wheels that are only good for novices. They're valuable for experts too, but the examples that we might use for experts are a little bit different. They're going to be further afield, whereas for novices, you might want to see something proximal. For experts, you might see something more distal as being valuable. And um, Picasso is a great example of how many of the most creative people are often also the most prolific. And often, some of the examples that teach us the most are the ones that we create ourselves. And throughout this talk, I'll use examples to refer both to artifacts that other people create and to the stuff that you're making uh, yourself. There's a wonderful example from Bales and Orland who talk about an art teacher who divides his class in half. Half of the class, we're going to grade you on the best thing that you make. The other, other half of the class, we're going to grade you on purely the quantity of stuff that you produce. So which group does better? Well, in this anecdote, while the quantity group was busily churning out piles of work and learning from their mistakes, the quality group sat around theorizing and at the end of the day had little more to show for themselves than grandiose theories and piles of dead clay. And I, I think this learning by doing is a real hallmark of prototyping. Prototypes embody design hypotheses and enable us to get feedback. And as with the quantity group, the goal in prototyping is not the artifact, it's the process. Create some prototypes, evaluate them, and move on. And Bill Buxton demonstrates this really well. Uh, this is his slide of the design process, where you start out and your purview is very wide. Everything's possible. And the fidelity of what you're creating is low. Later on, you gain more focus. And the fidelity of what you're creating is higher. You're still creating alternatives, but they're at a much narrower scale. And if you like, you can use as a really rough metaphor this, the idea of simulated annealing, where early on in the process, you want to have really high entropy to figure out where the right design is. And then later on in the process, you can dampen down that entropy and focus on getting things right. And I think a key part of doing research on design is figuring out how is it that we can measure creative results. And I'm going to come back to this theme at several points in the talk, because I think it's a question that deserves many answers. 
And uh, I'll show some of some work by, uh, that was led by Stephen Dow. And Stephen not only led this research, but he was kind enough to lend me his slides for this section. And one of the, the first projects that Stephen and I did together is we were looking for a task that would let us measure something objectively and at the same time had many paths to success. And so we had people create an egg drop device. And this is something that many of you may have done in high school where uh, here's my office window. We're taking this, throwing it out the third floor of the office. And uh, lo and behold, the egg actually survives this fall. I didn't make this one. The one I made didn't, didn't do so well. <laughs> People came up with all sorts of stuff. Some of them worked well. Some of them worked terribly. Lots and lots of different designs. The weirdest part about this first study is that when we talked to people who collectively had produced completely different things, at the end of the day, here's what they were saying about their ideas. They felt like whatever they produced was the, not only the best thing, but the only possible thing. This seems to be the only idea. There needs to be a platform and then it's going to push it as possible with materials. I, I, I don't see any of that video. I'm not a very good outside the box thinker, so I kind of just had one idea and I was going to try and make it work. I kind of went with the whole parachute idea and the, what I had from the beginning. So. This is the best approach for such a design. <laughs> And what they're, what they're exhibiting here is what Carl Dunker termed functional fixation. In the 1940s, he had a lot of people work on tasks like this candle problem here, where the task is affix the candle to the wall such that the wax doesn't drip on the table. About 20% of people figure it out. If you make a small tweak to this, such that you give people the exact same set of materials, only with the tacks outside the box, almost everybody realizes that you can use the box as the holder for the candle to catch the wax. And so we were interested in how do we get people outside of this fixation? And the strategy that we employed was asking people to create multiple alternatives in parallel as opposed to serial iteration. And in this case, we had people design a web advertisement and so we either had them uh, create six ideas in parallel, getting feedback after each, or three, or I'm sorry, six ideas serially, or three ideas in parallel, and then two, and then a final one. And what we found is people came up with all sorts of stuff. You know, you get the really good stuff, the bad stuff, some of it is technically good, other ones are really creative, all over the map. And what's fun about doing something like web advertisements is that you can actually then release them on the web. Over the last three years, we've run millions of ads on the various uh, major advertising platforms. And overall, what we saw out of this study was that the participants who were in the parallel condition produced ads that got more clicks than those in the serial condition. Not only did they get more clicks, but also we were getting more time on site. And so these ads were drawing the right people through to the ambidextrous magazine. And furthermore, they got higher expert ratings because clicks may not be the be all of, of design quality. And so it's interesting to see that these different measures all line up in favor of parallel. And I think one reason for that is we saw that the, the people in the parallel condition uh, produced more diverse designs. So, you know, why is this parallel approach giving people higher quality results? I think one of the major advantages that you have with a parallel design approach is the ability to separate your ego from the artifact that you produce. If I have only one idea and it gets negative feedback, that's a knock against me. If I have multiple ideas, it's easier to see that this is all part of the process and we can draw some things from some place and, and it's all good. And here's uh, one person talking about the frustration of being in the, the serial condition. These guys, you know, are telling me that I am completely, you know, doing something wrong here. So it took me a while to get past the I'm a failure at this and to, well, okay, how can I go about fixing it in the ways they suggested? So there was a, a short period where there was the emotional response overwhelmed any positive, like, logical impact that this ended up having. And I think with the parallel design, it makes it easier to compare the multiple alternatives and then transfer the insights that you're getting to new situations. And uh, you know, one of the great mysteries here is that analogical reasoning is central to cognition. But given that, 
people transfer in real situations a lot less than you might expect. And can we remedy this situation? There's a, a study I really like by Dedry Gentner and colleagues where she has people either in a traditional business school case study approach where you read a case and then talk about it, or she'll have people in her analogical condition read two cases and describe the similarities and differences. And this explicit bubbling up of the principles by comparison leads to about a threefold increase in transfer to novel situations. So th this is pretty cool. And the next thing we're going to look at is we've seen how this has benefits for individuals. Does this have benefits for groups? So here we're going to have three conditions. Uh, we're going to have people either create and share multiple prototypes, create multiple and share one, or, uh, or create one and share one. And this time our client is going to be uh, face aids. And again, all sorts of stuff that people created, some really good work, some not so good work. And we see a huge benefit of being able to share multiple designs with a peer as part of the design process. And uh, we see this across a number of different measures. And there are several benefits that you get out of sharing multiple designs. Uh, people explore more. They borrow more from each other, if for no other reason than the practical benefit of being able to see more alternatives. How did others tackle this problem? They had more engaging conversations. They were at higher consensus. And most interestingly to me, there was an increase in group rapport only in the share multiple condition. We asked people after an icebreaker exercise at the beginning of the design process how they felt about their partner using this graphical Likert scale. Asked them again at the end of the process. In the share one conditions, people felt less close to their partner. Share multiple, they felt more close. And this, is, this resonates with one of Bill Buxton's results with Mariam Tahiti, uh, where he found that sharing multiple prototypes with users yielded more useful feedback from users. And I think a major reason for that is having multiple alternatives helps provide a vocabulary. The reason you're the designer and they're the users is you have a much better sense of the design space of possible alternatives. And the users don't, whereas if you give them multiple options, they can use those as a vocabulary for talking about the designs. So we've talked a bunch about uh, visual design and, and product design domains. And I wanted to share Joel Brandt's work, which uh, looked at programming with examples. And uh, the other thing that I think is relevant about Joel's work here is it's a nice illustration about how you can use these insights of the power of examples and bake them into programming tools that help people be more effective. And also use these tools as a probe that helps advance our, our theoretical understanding. And I think, again, this is something that you'll, you'll all be really familiar with. Uh, we started this work by having folks come into our lab, and we gave them programming tasks, like design a web-based chat room. Uh, and so you know, you give somebody a task like this, and at some point they're going to say, and as one of our participants did, oh, you know, good grief, I don't remember the syntax for forms. Great programmer just doesn't happen to remember that particular vocabulary. OK, that's fine. So what she does is exactly what I bet most of you all would do. Two seconds later, out on Google, search for HTML forms. OK, so we go, we grab the first result out of there. We're going to click on that. And we're going to scroll down, go down to the bottom of the page here, where we've got some code that we might use. So we copy that. We paste it into our editor. We add some of our own code. And then just a few minutes after saying, I don't remember how to do this, basic version is up and running. And this would have taken orders of magnitude longer in the days before the web, unless you happen to have it in your own archive. And so what I think is interesting about this is nearly a quarter of the time that people spent programming in our study, their active window was their web browser. And it's not because they were on Facebook. It's because they were looking for examples to be able to adapt to the situation they needed. And I think that by having examples at the ready, it does more than just speed people up in getting their task done. It can qualitatively change the strategies that people use when they're programming. And the other thing that's fun about studying programming uh, in, this, in this light is that um, a lot of the, the research, like our, our candle that we were trying to tack to the wall, has a right or wrong answer. And a lot of creative work just isn't that clear cut. Also, in a lot of previous research, 
there was a carefully selected set of examples, and we're going to look whether you borrow from that. And the web is much more wild and woolly, and so understanding how people work with that much more freeform set is pretty interesting. And what's, what's strange, given how much all programmers use the web today, is that today our development environment and our search engine essentially know nothing about each other. My web browser doesn't know that I'm spending the rest of my time programming. My development environment doesn't know that I went and grabbed that example out of the web as opposed to thought it up in my head. And so Joel, uh, for his dissertation work, built a system called Blueprint in collaboration with our friends at Adobe Labs. And here's how Blueprint works. Uh, this is the Adobe Flex development environment. And say you've got somebody who'd like to write a function that loads some XML data from the web. So what they can do with Blueprint is they can type in, we'll zoom in, and they can type in a search query like busy cursor. It'll go out on the web, and we'll show them example results. These are uh, culled from the Adobe Forum and other blessed third-party blogs. And what's nice about them is that they interleave English and code. And so sure enough, the line that we need about setting a busy cursor is right here. So we can, uh, we can grab that. It also has the remove busy cursor line, handy thing about examples. Uh, if you'd like to set your busy cursor, maybe you'd also like to remove that later. So uh, we grab that, and we can paste it in. When we paste it in, we not only get the line of code, we add the query that we use to get it and the provenance of where it came from. It gives credit to the person that created the example. And if we ever need to update it or there's a bug, you know where it came from. Um, and I think this provenance can help create an ecosystem where there's more incentives for creating reusable content. And the fact that this is written as examples I think is really important because uh, there's a small company in Mountain View called Google that has a system called Google Code which indexes usefully uh, all the open source software they can get their hands on. And the difference between Blueprint which is relying on an index set of examples that uh, have both English and code, and the Google code search is that if you were to search for busy cursor within the Google code search, you may well end up on line 7,642 of somebody's text file, and it's really hard to extract from that the small piece of information that you need for your task. Um, under the hood, we do leverage the nice technology from that, those folks in Mountain View, and um, Doing the blueprint research was fun because Joel showed me how it's possible for academics to play in the search space. I think for a while, a lot of us felt like, well, the search folks with the big data centers, they can do things that we can't do in academia. And the strategy that, that Joel came up with was to interpose a proxy server in the middle so that we're going to rewrite the queries on the outbound version. And notably, uh, Adobe already had a Google search appliance that was indexing stuff for its own help system. And then on the return trip, we can re-rank, we can reformat, we can do anything we want, including cache the results for increased performance, and then feed those back to the user. One thing that's important to know is, does this integration of example search directly into your development environment lead to better outcomes? And so, we had professional flex programmers, these are people who do this full time for a living, come into the lab and we gave them a number of programming tasks. And what we found was that the people who were faster at example uh, finding were faster at programming and that was in the, in the blueprint condition. And in addition to being faster, when we had independent experts rate the quality of the code, they produced higher quality code as well. That's great. Does that line up with anything you might see in the wild? And so uh, in the spring of 2009, we deployed Blueprint on Adobe Labs. And uh, you can still download it today. Uh, and we had a bunch of users uh, over that summer use it. People are still using it, but the numbers I'll report are from that summer. And what was nice is we had a, a kind of natural controlled experiment where we've got our Blueprint system, which is leveraging this, this search appliance. And the Adobe Community Help Forum, which is using the exact same corpus, the only difference is the user interface. And if we compare the logs from these two systems, you see a couple of interesting things. So one of the things that you see is that the example results with Blueprint were much more often sufficient, the holy grail of search in many cases, 
is to have the snippet give you what you need so you don't even need to click through. And that was true about three times more often with Blueprint than with the community help. The second thing that we saw is people were querying with code more. When example search is directly integrated into your development environment, you can just double click on a, on a, a variable type and say, Shh, give me some examples for this. The last thing that we saw is that people re-found the same examples much more often with Blueprint, about 60% more. And I think this is an example of how it changes your strategies. Uh, I came across an article in the New York Times this spring uh, that was talking about this. So an experiment where you give people trivia facts, they're much less likely to remember the trivia if they believe they'll have access to a computer later. Interestingly, in a second study, if these trivia facts are organized on the file system, people actually do a better job remembering where the trivia fact is located than they do what the trivia fact is. Appropriately, uh, when I was preparing this talk and wanted to grab this screenshot, uh, I didn't remember the exact details. I did remember uh, that it was sometime this year that I had sent it to my research group and that it was an article from the New York Times. So I typed that query into my email system, and the first result that came up was uh, this page. Um, I'd like to turn back to design and, and show a, a study that uh, my former PhD student Brian Lee did, where we built a really simple example browser on top of the Firefox direct manipulation web editor. And we had people create a web page for a student using either uh, this simple example browser of other home pages or a template system. And what we found was that, uh, and then we had these pages rated by outside experts based on how well they achieved the design brief that the, the fake student we'd created was asking for. And what we found was that the pages that, uh, the people that got the examples condition produced higher rated pages than those that were in the templates condition. And this inspired us to go further and say, okay, can we automatically adapt the examples that people are creating into these novel situations? And um, because, you know, as we saw at the beginning, people often use view source to be able to copy bits of code, but that, you know, that can be time consuming and manual good computer scientists, can we do this automatically? And there, you know, there are several tools today, like Apple's iWeb, that will let you type your own content into templates, but that lacks all of the context that we saw in the examples case. And also, the corpus of stuff, while growing, is, is much more limited. So what if any page on the web could be a template, and we could adapt that completely automatically? And uh, here's what Ranjitha's bricolage system does. So you can take a page that you like the content of, say the Gmail login screen, and a page that you like the style of, say the Mint login screen. And by style, I don't just mean green background, but also the layout of items on the page. And we can adapt that automatically, and here's that re-rendering. So we see you got the background, you got the type. We also flipped the location of these to match what was in the Mint page. And, uh, and this, is, this is really fun. Now, in order to be able to do this, one of the nice things about working on the web is that every web page has an underlying document object model, the DOM. And you can see an example of that here. And so the DOM offers a tree. Uh, but with the modern web, the relationship between the DOM tree under the hood and what you see visually, especially with things like CSS, is quasi-arbitrary, and so this is an example of what you get out of this system to start. And there are a number of things that you can see are siblings that are actually at very different places in the tree. So the first step for being able to rewrite web pages is we're going to canonicalize the DOM so that by a set of four rules, so that siblings live underneath the same parent, uh, that ancestry relationships are preserved, and a few other things. And so what our bento algorithm does for doing this is uh, we're going to take the same page, and after running it through, we get a DOM representation that more closely matches the visual hierarchy here. And now we want to know, well, if we're going to map this page to that page, what goes where? So we went out on the web, and we had folks uh, create labelings between pairs of pages. So we highlight an element on the page, and we say, what's the corresponding element on the other side? 
And then you can do a whole bunch of stuff with that. So for the purposes of this talk, we're going to have, and then a bunch of machine learning happens. And the output of that is uh, you can do things like rapidly brainstorm a number of alternatives. And we saw, as we saw from Steven's work, there's a lot of benefit to being able to rapidly come up with these alternatives. So uh, we can take a page. This is a, a fellow, Rick Catlow. Uh, maybe he would like to wonder how else his design could be. So uh, here's another example that's, that's nice. And we can re-render into that design. Uh, here's one and re-rendered into that. And here's another one, and re-rendered into that. And one thing that's interesting is our algorithm takes account for a number of different features. So it takes account both for semantic things, like are you a header or a footer? It also takes into account sibling and ancestry. And do you need all of these terms? Well, if you put all of the magic sauce together, uh, bricolage matches what a human rater does about 80% of the time, which is about the inner rater reliability that you see for people. And if you pull out any of the key elements of the learning algorithm, uh, then you get a, a significantly worse performance. And so you need to be able to balance these multiple considerations in order to be able to produce human quality mappings. Another thing that you can do with this technology is uh, say you have a desktop page that you would like to be able to automatically produce uh, a mobile version of. Well, one thing you can do is you can offer Bricolage an example of a mobile site that you like, and then we can automatically render, uh, here's an iPhone version or an Android version of that same blog based on the, the, the retargeting. Another thing that's really fun, our optimization approach, normally what we do is we find the lowest cost mapping. We keep that mapping and we throw away the, the cost number. You can flip it around. You can throw away the mapping and keep the cost number. And you can use that cost number as an approximate distance metric for how similar different designs are. So here are uh, laid out from similar to different, a couple of different pages. And what you can see is that the most similar of these three also has three columns, also has this big horizontal area in the middle, and also has nav at the top. The least similar of these has none of those elements. Did a great job with being able to retarget it, uh, different pages. How do you find pages to be able to retarget them? And search engines today don't work very well because all they give you is the keywords that are in a page. They don't give you uh, minimal pages or funky pages or any of the other design-oriented attributes that you may want to search on, pages like this. Uh, so Daniel and Ankita, um, I'll give you a preview of work they're going to show at WIST next week. Uh, this is a system called Detour, which gives you a gallery-based interface for being able to find examples. And it has a couple of attributes. Uh, the first one is that we, we provide both a keyword search and a visual search for, uh, for gallery exploration. Um, in this version, we've got uh, a curated database of three, 400 different pages. And we're going to algorithmically extract, using bricolage, features from those pages. And then we can build a recommender system on top of that. So if there's a page you like, you can ask, show me more pages like this. Does this work well relative to other things you might have available, like web search? We had people find inspirational designs for redesigning uh, this web page called the Science Bus. So uh, great group of folks, maybe not a beautiful page. Can we help them think about how to do better? What we found was that uh, Detour produced pages that the Science Bus folks and experts rated much more highly than pages that participants found uh, using a, a Google search engine. Interestingly, we also included in our raters random pages pulled from our curated corpus. And those random pages did just as well as what people found through Google, though not as good as what we found through Detour. And I think this was, this was a fun result to get, because in computer science, we often think that scale is sort of an automatic good. And what, what this confound shows us is, well, you know, maybe uh, the scale is in some ways a drawback. Or at the very least, if we're going to scale this up, which is a current research project, uh, we'll have to do some smart things so that the good designs bubble to the top. One thing you might be wondering at this point is, you know, when is adapting examples legal? 
or ethical. And I, and I think this research raises a, a number of interesting legal and ethical questions. And in broad strokes, the law provides good support when what you're producing is perceived as novel and less support when it's perceived as purely derivative. And one strategy for playing it safe would be to say these automatic tools that we're building will restrict those to pages that have been uh, offered up as open content a la Creative Commons or open source software. I think furthermore, one reason that the legal answers to these questions are really murky is precisely because they're new. And I think one role for research software tools is as a way of posing new legal and ethical questions. The last thing that I'd like to talk about today is how I use examples in teaching design. And a lot of this comes from my own, my own experience in design education. Um, a, a wonderful illustration of the powerful of examples is the informal learning that comes from a design studio. This is Stanford's product design loft. And you can see how it's filled with Barbie dolls and umbrellas and all sorts of stuff. And so you can walk in on any day and immediately see what people are working on. You can see when the work takes a new direction. You can see when stuff gets discarded. You have a way of knowing who knows what. Where are the experts for any particular technique in here? And um, the studio technology has been around a while. It was actually invented in 1819 with the, the founding of the Ecole de Beaux Arts in Paris. And it's endured for nearly 200 years. And in a weird way, it was actually really similar to my own uh, undergraduate experience, where the, by virtue of the fact that uh, computing was all done on uh, Unix workstations, all of the undergraduate Unix workstations were in one room, the Sun Lab. And that meant that all computer science majors uh, sat shoulder to shoulder doing their programming together. You got to see what was coming down the pipe for next year. You, when you were stuck, you could ask other people for help and for advice. Uh, you got to mentor younger students, which was a great way to practice your skills. And I think that, perversely, one of the worst things that ha that's happened to computer science education is the proliferation of cheap laptops. Because while many students still work together in groups, uh, you do get more ghettoization, and not everybody benefits from this, this cohort effect. And I was visiting UIUC last week and, and talking with my friend, Carrie Karahelios, and she told me that when MIT got rid of the Athena cluster, the cohort sense among computer scientists really went down. And so I think there's a lot to be gained from this kind of co-located collaboration. And uh, so here's the, uh, the web page for the course that I teach, uh, the Intro HCI course. We have uh, this year 160 students from more than a dozen different majors. And we march through a 10-week user-centered design process. Many of the ideas and strategies in this course uh, can be traced back to the, the methods HCI course here at CMU. And um, so one of the things that we have students do is that assignments are due every Friday, 8 AM. And we use this online software that John Mitchell's group developed called Courseware. So students can submit assignments. Here's a, a chunk of a need finding a student uh, submitted last week. So this is a write-only user interface up until Friday at 8 AM. We worked with uh, the Courseware folks to develop this exact feature. After 8 AM Friday, it becomes a read-only user interface. So you can see what everybody else in the class has done. And I asked my students, and they're in the Facebook generation, and yes, they absolutely find out what other students have done. Uh, and they're often a little bit shy about the fact that their own work can be seen. And so you get a social incentive for doing higher quality work. Uh, and then what we do is uh, we have people participate in an in-person 12 to 15 person studio where they present their design work each week and share it with their peers. And at the end of the studio, we have the students uh, reflect on and self-assess the work that they produced that week. And there's a great book uh, on self-assessment by David Bowd. It, it's really, really interesting. And the way that I got into self-assessment was um, when I started the first design course I, I taught at Stanford, uh, I got pretty good teaching ratings. But there was one question that I, I did, I was in the 13th percentile for. And that question was, how fair is the grading? And this is understandable because teaching design in an engineering school, students are looking for things that have more clear right or wrong answers. And so my solution ultimately to this problem 
Uh, and, and I think, as we were talking about at lunch, this is a nice example of how measurement is important. But a measure doesn't automatically offer up what should you do next. What do you do when you have a 13th percentile of, uh, of this? Well, you could say nothing. The students are idiots. Or you could have one of many other options. And the solution that I came up with was, We'll have the students grade themselves. Then they can't complain, because they, they did it to themselves. And I was curious to see how well they would do. And what I've found is that having some guidance is, is really essential. And so uh, we do this in several different ways. The first is that we provide a grading rubric, which is the hardest part of this entire process. This is now the third year that we've done some form of self-assessment. And the rubrics are the part that's still evolving most rapidly. And so when we release each assignment, we offer, uh, here are the three axes that you're going to be graded on and what a score means for each of those axes. Uh, and we also offer good examples from previous years. Once I offered not so good examples from previous years, which from a learning perspective is really valuable, but uh, it's, you know, somebody might get grumpy and, and come after me. So I decided to play it safe, and right now we only show good examples. We'll also add links to good examples when we do the, the grading by the, by the staff. So the students grade themselves according to this rubric. And then uh, that afternoon, the staff meets, and all of the TAs together and I, uh, we, we go over and we grade all the assignments across all of the studios. And we do this blind to what the students graded themselves. If the two grades are close, the students get their own grade. And so uh, if, if you happen to bowl it straight, uh, you're completely on your own. Now, this is a relatively new experiment. And for many different kinds of reasons, we didn't want to just let the students have complete free run. So we added these bumpers, which is that if you're too far off the mark, then you get the, uh, the grade the, the teaching staff assigned. And we're tinkering around with. Uh, encouragements for, for being right. One of the things that uh, is interesting about this, if you're within a certain number of points, you get your own grade. And if you're not, you get this teaching staff grade. As a student came up to me last year, furious. And he was like, this is totally wrong. You're ruining everything. I can't believe it. I, every conversation with this student started that way. Um, <laughs> Or, or, or the opposite, but the, you know, the, uh, the, the direction was variable, but the amplitude was fixed and high. And uh, he was like, don't you realize you could figure out what the TA was going to grade you? You could give yourself that increment on top of that grade, and you could get an unfairly high score. And what I told him, and what I now tell the entire class, is if your ability to understand how your teachers are going to evaluate you is so acutely accurate that you're able to consistently pull this off, then I'm more than happy to give you a couple of points of benefit to your grade. Because that ability, uh, that, 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 that theory of mind ability to understand what others are going to think of your work is such an important life skill that uh, <laughs> it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really handy. Uh, and so. Uh, that was our, our game theoretic analysis. <laughs> um, what we have seen that, that's really consistent with the literature is that the highest performing, so last year on average, students underrated themselves uh, by about four points. Um, the highest performing students were most likely to underrate themselves. The lowest performing students most likely to overrate. One reason for both of these, on the high side, you have modesty. It's difficult in the American context to say, I'm an A plus. Uh, and on the other hand, it's real hard to actually uh, face the sober light of day and say that was a C-level assignment. Um, and I think another thing that's going on is that the high performing students hold themselves to very high standards. And so it's not surprising that they're like, I did a pretty good job, but I could have done better. And uh, the low performing students hold them to lower standards. And so by reflecting on that differential of the standards, uh, we can show especially the low performing students of, of where they're, they're out of line. Another thing that this does is a real tension in, in grading creative work is that it shifts the teaching staff into a role of being evaluators. And I think teaching works best when the teachers can be coaches that encourage you to excel as much as you can. And by having students uh, self-assess, 
and having a rubric so that we're not grading on a curve that helps move us as the teaching staff from evaluators to being coaches. The craziest part of this experiment is when we move into development for these projects and each one has its own nuances. We realized we couldn't write rubrics that would cover where anybody might be at any point in their project. So we had students write their own schedule and their own rubrics. And surprisingly, this also works pretty well. Uh, I, I'm curious about the portability of this, and I think that this is something that we'll need to evolve over time. Uh, but on a meta level, this is, a, this is kind of, for me, a pretty exciting development. And I think one of the reasons why the, the enrollment in the intro HCI class uh, has been growing by about 10 students a year in, in the seven years I've, I've been at Stanford, I inherited this course from Terry Winograd. And, and broadly, I think one of the reasons why so many students are attracted to design right now is that a lot of design is about finding problems as much as it is about solving problems. And I think this is such an important skill. And I think the HCI courses probably teach the problem finding part more explicitly than other courses do. And, but I, I think that excitement about finding and tackling really exciting problems is something that draws a lot of computer scientists. Last year, the enrollment in Stanford computer science courses hit its all-time high. 92% of Stanford undergraduates now take a computer science class. And what's interesting is, unlike the dot-com years, where my sense was a lot of people were looking for a way to sell pet food on the internet and make a million dollars, a lot of the students that we're seeing right now are really excited about making, and, and that's just a blast. Um, and I think going forward, I think one of the reasons why we're seeing this, this enrollment and enthusiasm continue is students are realizing of all the possible opportunities of how computing can affect our lives around the globe. And so we're seeing that computing moves. It's not just only for office workers. It can move and uh, it can be anywhere. So including uh, my student Neil Patel did his dissertation research in India and actually just moved to Gujarat full time where he bought an apartment. Uh, and I, I plotted, this is a graph I plotted of all the software in the world. And I plotted it from the uh, largest to smallest piece of software. And what you can see is that you get this big software up here which are the small number of very large applications like operating systems and web browsers and Photoshop and Word and stuff like that. And then you get this large number of smaller software programs like the biologist who writes a script to be able to connect to lab equipment. And I think what's interesting is that the development methods that we use for each of these may be quite different and that there's, there's a lot of opportunity in both places, but I, I think in particular in supporting the opportunistic software. Uh, Brad Myers has estimated that there are about 12 million programmers in the US. And Rick Rashid uh, estimated for me, he, he thinks about 50 million uh, worldwide. So that's a, that's a pretty big number of people that we could impact. And lastly, I think designing interfaces was, used to be a heck of a lot easier when, for the most part, we used to have a screen about this big and a keyboard and a mouse. But things are getting a lot more diverse. And so now you've got laptops and mobile phones and large giant walls and wristwatches and tables and flexible screens and tablets. And um, this increasing diversity of form factors is posing a challenge to all sorts of folks. The New York Times today, I'm told, has separate design teams for the web version for the print version, for the reader version, for the iPhone and iPad version. And so you say, from a company that's fundamentally about journalism, that its core competency is in journalism, it's unreasonable to ask that there be these you know, increasing uh, design teams to handle all of the different form factors. And you might say, well, uh, yeah, but they're not a tech company. The tech companies have this figured out. And, uh, we had our keynote speaker of the computer forum meeting last year was uh, someone from Facebook. And he was talking about the challenges of designing for these increasingly diverse form factors, where he said, uh, you know, so at first we had two developers and three code bases. We had the m.facebook.com, iPhone.facebook.com, and Facebook for iPhone. Then Facebook for Android comes out. And so now we've got you know, seven developers, four, four code bases, and hundreds of apps. And eventually you get to this Facebook for X. Um, and for any given platform, somebody's figured it out. And I think one of the things that we can do with tools like Bricolage going forward is my vision is that we ought to be able to 
uh, infer a lot of the design intuition that's going into making effective platforms for particular devices and make it such that you can, divide, you can design for as many of the platforms as you want, as many of the different user abilities as you want, as many of the different use contexts as you want. But at some point when you run out of steam, we can help you by automatically or semi-automatically tailoring those based on good examples that we've culled uh, and adapt your content and, and do it in your style. So what we've seen today is four research themes that show the value of being able to create and compare multiple alternatives, how we can use examples to power better design tools, and how we can automatically adapt examples into, into new contexts, into other designs, and also how we can use examples in teaching computer science. And uh, I wanted to thank you all again for coming today and open it up for questions. Yes, Jim. Uh, I wanted to study the procedure, right? It occurred to me that it happened there, but it would also be interesting if they take maybe, you know, the person showed that after all this design, they showed it for that more than five, and a lot of things. What if they've taken the best three? Is it a chance that that, that the runner-up would have gotten even more things? So Jim's question was, what if in our design studies we had somebody, we ran the top three as opposed to the top one. And Stephen's done a whole bunch of studies other than what I showed him today. So he may have done that. But I'll, I'll answer the question uh, in a slightly different way, which is I think the role of design is changing. Before the availability of easy analytics, the designer's role in a lot of ways, many designers have always produced multiple alternatives. But ultimately, you often were forced to roll one thing out because the, you know, if you're shipping on CD or you're shipping a car, you can't ship three different Fords and, and find out later very easily. With online deployment and online analytics, I think the designer's role is changing. So it's no longer, let's do whatever we can pre-release to pick the best one and then hope. And it's shipping. To, it's shifting to, we it it for tractability and brand reasons. It's unreasonable to release every single possible element in the design. You, know, you don't want to test every point in the design space. But the designer's role is now to be, let's pick a couple of strategic points in the design space that we think might be good. And as long as one of those three is a winner, you're in business. And I think that's a really interesting shift. And the impact of that is going to take several years to, to fully suss out. Jason. Where do you think design patterns fits into this body of work? Wonderful question. Uh, Jason's question was about uh, where does design patterns fit in. The, and this is, I think, one of the reasons why Dedry Gentner's work really rung true for us is that there's a lot of value of, so there's a lot of value in principle case comparison. And what you see with design patterns is they offer a principle and they offer a case. And so when it is possible to have a pattern for the particular thing that you're after. I think that design patterns uh, work quite well. And I think one, uh, an interesting research direction would be uh, if we had a set of patterns, can we crawl the web to find automatically other instances of checkout flows or of uh, speaking navigation or, or some other such thing? And I, I think that's a really great direction for future work. Yes. I guess that's the accessibility of interactive examples. HTML is pretty accessible, but what about other sorts of software? Right now, the bricolage system, uh, we intercept the, the rendered HTML, and we store what happens sort of after any of the server side stuff. But in our current implementation, we don't handle, for example, interactive JavaScript or other things that happen on the page, let alone you know, things that are even more interactive than web pages. I think the principles still hold. The ease of archiving and adapting that stuff is, is hard, but that's, that's why we're in business. I think we've got, uh, we've got a lot ahead of us. That's a, I think it's a really interesting direction for, for future work. Yes? I don't, I don't remember if this was in the talk. Uh, did you explore the space of novices versus experts in terms of who you're assisting? Uh, we have in, in several ways. So 
uh, in the study that Brian Lee ran, for example, uh, we factored out both novices and experts, uh, more novice and more expert. And in that case, we both groups got about an equal bump from the examples. I think if you went up to Picasso level quality of web designer, then seeing two dozen home pages would no longer offer uh, inspirational value as much because hopefully those are all loaded in RAM by the time you're that much of an expert. Uh, it can still offer practical value. You can immediately recognize an example and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, and the studies that Stevens run will often do some kind of pretest for expertise. There's a bunch of different ways you can do it. And we're counterbalance those uh, across conditions. Um, and so I think the a really cool direction for future work is how could you automatically come up with the El Greco painting or Matisse sketch or Fang mask that would inspire somebody who is the very best in the field. And so for a web designer, it may not be another web design. It may be a vintage automobile. And how could you find that automatically, even if you got the choice of you get a 1,000 examples somewhere on the screen, put something that will be inspiring. Total, totally cool thing to, to think about. Yes? Uh, with the ethics of copying a website, it seems like uh, people are already doing that. So it may not be, the owners may not be on you to do it more ethically. But you have the opportunity to scaffold a more uh, ethical attribution when they do make a derivative. I was wondering if with the Creative Commons license, if it's like a CC BY personal software, slip something in so that it fills the license. Uh, in, our, in the current version of the various software tools I've shown, we don't automatically propagate the license, uh, but that's something that we, that we plan to do in bricolage, for example. I think that, uh, and one thing that you can do that'd be neat is if you have, for example, some of these Creative Commons sites may subscribe themselves to one of the design galleries that's out there on the web. And one of the ways that you could gain currency as a designer is that a lot of people have adapted and borrowed your designs. And you can have the tools hook into the database. So we can automatically say, and these 27 things riffed off this example in one way or another, which I think will be a really interesting way to browse things. One of the, in the Picasso example, the, the story of the Picasso painting is fascinating and would be, uh, in fact, is several books by itself. One of the interesting things is that people's stories about how that painting evolved changed over the decades. And so in the 60s, when Picasso was the director of uh, the Prado Museum in Madrid, he really emphasized the role that the early Iberian sculptures played in those three left-hand figures of the painting. Uh, and uh, so the, and other parts got, you know, pushed to the side a little bit. And so being able to have provenance tracking, I think, is, is key. It's something that the academic world does pretty well with references uh, and is, is harder in other media. And so this offers a, a useful opportunity for that. And Randy. So this is a little off topic, maybe. But my experience with people looking at web pages is they all have extremely strong beliefs, and they're all contradictory. That if you try and do a design by committee, Nobody can agree on anything compared to other artifacts where I think there's some general sense of what's good and what's bad. But is that any relevant at all in this case, or is that your experience, or is there anyone to understand that? There's an apocryphal story somebody told me once, it's totally false, good story nonetheless, that the Guinness Book of World Records was produced by the Guinness Brewing Company because their patrons were getting into bar fights over facts rather than drinking beer. And that Guinness would put one of the books in every bar so that you could have the data settle the issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is one of the things that's really interesting about the web today, is if it's relatively easy to roll out design alternatives and test them, then that shifts the argument. I think uh, a great example, you know, Ron Kohavi, uh, who's done work at both Amazon and Microsoft, has done a lot of great work on this. Uh, he has a, a great paper called The Power of Controlled Experiments on the Web. One of the examples he gives is Amazon had a search results algorithm idea. So some folks in his group thought that if you ranked search results 
not by the keywords in the document, but by the probability that somebody would eventually buy that product after searching for whatever string, that would work out better. And it turns out hugely so to the tune of a fair chunk of change. And initially, the, the, the brass was very skeptical in, in Ron's telling. And by being able to roll it out, you say, all right. I think another thing that's interesting is that the amount of theory that we have in design is an awful lot less than we ought to. And, and, and part of it is, as Ansel Adams pointed out, the, the power of context. But I think we could start to have more principles. And in fact, I think some of the major web houses, by virtue of being able to run lots and lots of analytics, have that data, but it's not in the public sphere. And one important project would be, what if all of the small sites in the world were willing to share their analytics with a data collective, and you could mine that collective to build generalized principles of design? I, I think that would be really fantastic. Mike. So all your generalizations, for example, are for basically structural similarities. Yep. But it seems like you sort of wave your hands about this machine learning magic that happens too. It seems like there's a whole group of people in machine learning around the world that are worried about similarity in terms of content. And wouldn't you ultimately want to combine those two things in terms of how you do your generalization? Yes, and we do. And I couldn't figure out how to explain that briefly in this talk. Uh, the particular flavor of machine learning that we're doing is called structured prediction. And it's fun because it, it's, it's baking into the algorithm the correspondence between features rather than just the features themselves. And so uh, it's a sort, the, in the bricolage work, for example, we have a, uh, a, a, a kind of graph transformation algorithm where how the ease of transforming those graphs gives you the optimization cost of the mapping. I agree 100%. I just have a question about the big one side. So the big one side, the other 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 side, the design style and, and the purpose of it. So, it, I mean, is the algorithm superior comparing to those? So the question was about, there are many temperate, template gallery sites on the web, and they're getting better and more sophisticated. And so some of them today now allow you, like Google Image Search does, to search based on colors that are in a template or a few other attributes. Um, and so, Part of the answer, I think half of the answer is to say, conceptually, Detour is quite similar to the gallery interface that you see on some of the best template sites today. And hopefully, the results from that study would transfer to why those template sites are also valuable. The other half of the answer is that the bricolage features that we're able to gather from pages is much more sophisticated than the template sites do today, because they're not they don't have a good way of encoding structural features of the pages other than by hand labeling. And so hopefully uh, that offers a benefit. I think uh, in, the, in the case of what exactly are the axes that provide the maximal benefit for gallery-based search interfaces, I think doing that, that careful longitudinal evaluation still needs to be done. Well, I'll be happy to stick around afterwards if uh, there's any other questions. Thanks very much. Thank